what's going on? These kids, because you're calling this the dumbest generation. So something happened in their childhood. Basically, there was the detachment between the child and the parent, and it was replaced by essentially the, the tablet or computer or screen. Think of what the 15 year old could do in 2007. You know, Facebook had begun, Web 2.0 was taking off. Uh, so that we had a lot of more interactive activity, more behavior that could go through the screen than could happen in 1995. You've got people talking to one another. You have the eye, the handheld devices, as they were called, then were getting more sophisticated. Texting was coming along, photos. YouTube, you could, as, as YouTube put it in its original motto, which was in the upper left-hand corner, broadcast yourself. You could take pictures and send them to people. You could watch them. And the 15-year-olds, they were the digital natives. They were the early adopters. They were way ahead of the boomers like me in, in taking these tools and playing with them, innovating with them, finding new, you know, I need my son to tell me how to how to do my iPhone, uh, different different things, and brrr, you know he's got the thumbs and, and that flexible uh, uh, mind in front of a screen, so they could go into their rooms with these tools. The TV is still on. They still watched a lot of TV with teen TV shows. You know, Saved by the Bell is on. Uh, they have the music going. They could have the game going. They've got the laptop or or the or the the desktop open with a few windows. They're, they could be have, have the Facebook going and, and different social media. And they're texting about, you know, 3,000 texts a month but by, by 2010. And this was a 15-year-old's universe made up of other 15-year-olds and 15-year-old stuff. They could envelop themselves in youth culture, peer culture, peer pressure, more than any time in human history. I mean, I... I when I was 15, I didn't want to talk to my parents. I didn't care about some Walter Cronkite guy, you know, talking about, you know, well, Watergate and who cares? I got stuff, you know, that I'm that I'm doing, but I couldn't go somewhere anywhere else. That was the only screen in the house. And if it was on, I couldn't. I, I you know, I was there. I had to listen to it. There were I didn't have my own phone. There was one phone in the house. It was in the kitchen. You had to put your finger in a dial and turn it seven times to make a phone call. And I didn't have the privacy to, to talk to girls or something. So social life was effectively over for the rest of the night and all night long. It didn't start again until I went, went back to school. So there was adult pressure coming in to my, to my life, whether I wanted it or not. So I got a little more politics. There were more conversation between my parents that I would over here because I, I couldn't, you know, go to my room and, and, and get away from it. And the, uh, the pop culture at that time also wasn't so youth oriented. I mean, even cartoons would, would have a lot of classical music would be playing in them. And you, you get a lot of literary references going on. Johnny Carson would often end his show with an author. Guy's written a book for the last 10 minutes of the show. It would be a writer on there. You don't see that on the nighttime shows very much uh, anymore. That. I mean, almost every single show he would end in that way. So uh, I just got an exposure. I'm not better than the millennials. I wasn't a better teenager than they were. I got in trouble uh, a lot, but I, I did get, a, I, I was in a world a little bit that would counter the peer pressure with the adult stuff. The digital age, it freed them up. And a lot of people cheered them on. You know, 60 Minutes had an episode, here come the millennials. They're gonna transform the workplace. They're gonna change the way we shop. We're going, they're gonna change the way we communicate. They're leading the way. They're gonna lead the way into the 21st century. That was the, the cheering going on. And so I wrote this first book, The Dumbest Generation, how the digital age stupefies young Americans and jeopardizes our future or don't trust anyone under 30. That was the joke in, in the title at the end. And in 2008, because I said, this is, this is not good. It's not good for 15 year olds to be you know, taking pictures of themselves all the time. It, it just, it feeds into youth narcissism too much. Uh, it's not good for them to be texting all night long. Uh, we got to get them away, get them out of that circuit. And so that book came out 
And a lot of people said, you're a Luddite, you know, you're get off my lawn. We've heard this before about Elvis and everything. And I said, no, look, first of all, I'm, I'm happy to play the stern elder role. I have, I wish I had more of that when I was a teenager, but look, this is a radical change in life here. This digital age, it's a revolution going on and, and don't be so blithe about the possible effects, especially on the young who are diving into it. They're reading fewer books. They're learning less history. They're, they're not getting politics because they're not listening to the news with, with, with their parents. They're not reading newspapers. Uh, the web offers so many things. I mean, I, I, there's great stuff on YouTube, you know, old, old clips that I brought into class before, but that's not where they're going. So I predict this is going to be very bad. Well, now we're 15 years past and the millennials are now 33 years old. They're entering middle age and the thrill is gone. You know, the, the millennialist dreams for them seems to have, uh, seem to have you know, popped. They're bitter. A lot of them are depressed, anxiety. Uh, most of them don't have any religion. You know, they don't they don't go to church or temple or have any real transcendent orientation in their lives. They don't think much of their country. Only about a third of them consider themselves patriots. And patriotism is a good feeling. You know, it's good to feel good about your home. This is who you're you're a citizen of this place. Do you want to be ashamed, feel guilty? America's bad, America's done bad things. That yeah, yeah. let me ask this question. How do you connect, if you do, and I think you do, this digital age and what all the things you just been explaining as far as how millennials were raised and the fact that they overwhelmingly support somebody like Bernie Sanders, who is a devout socialist, Democrat socialist? What, what's the connection there? Uh, a couple of things. One, Bernie Sanders tapped into their disappointment and bitterness, and he gave them some people to blame right? The, the fat cats and, and the corporations. And when you're disappointed in life, it feels better when you can identify a culprit. You find a villain. And that's, that's one thing that Bernie Sanders gave them. Now, the socialism side is, doesn't, it, doesn't it, isn't socialism sound like a very good idea? I mean, we take care of everybody. We appreciate everybody. You know, we have a more shared sense of things. We don't have these obscenely wealthy people and all these poor people out there. Socialism just sounds so nice. And if you've never read George Orwell, if you don't know anything about the totalitarian societies of the 20th century, if you don't understand that revolutions most of the time go badly, the American Revolution was very much of an exception. The French Revolution became a bloodbath. The Russian Revolution became a bloodbath. Mao's Revolution, massive starvation, horrible displacement. The Cambodian Revolution gave us the killing fields. They don't know any of these things. They live, remember, that, that it's almost better to call them utopians. This in the, in the new book, The Dumbest Generation Grows Up, From Stupefied Youth to Dangerous Adults. I call them, I say, it's really better to call them utopians than socialists. I know what people are getting at when, when they say socialists, but they don't know anything about, you know, state owned uh, uh, industries. They, they don't, they don't know the economics of socialism. They haven't read any socialist thinkers or Karl Marx, uh, but they just have an idea. You know, everyone deserves to be happy. Love is love. You should love anybody you want to love and everyone should respect you for that. You should be whatever you want to be. That's their idea of socialism. What socialism would do is give them the material basis to become a wonderful life. That, that, that's what it means. Now, what does a utopian do when he's disappointed at age 30? He, he says, you know, we deserve a better society. And we don't have that better society because there are some bad people out there. And if we just get rid of the bad people, we will have a place where everyone can be happy. This is why they are the leaders on cancel culture. They actually have a vindictive philosophy of life. And this is recording in, in surveys. 
if they see an injustice being done, and it could be a microaggression injustice, small, small little thing, they want that villain punished. The culprit is going to pay for that. So they'll sign a petition with 2,000 other people to get a stranger fired from a job. Thank you again to our guest, Mark Bauerlein. Check out his book that has just been released, The Dumbest Generation Grows Up. Thank you to our producer, Michael Parker. Thank you all for listening. We'll be back soon with another episode of The Hidden Truth Show. Thank you for listening to The Hidden Truth Show with Jim Breslow. You can find us at hiddentruthshow.com. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Hidden Truth Show. Join us again next week for another episode of Hidden Truth Show with Jim Breslow.